Today is the 13th Sunday after Pentecost. We'll be here in Boston, Massachusetts. In the epistle, the epistle for this 13th Sunday, Sigma is going to Galatians chapter 3. Brethren, to Abraham were the promises made, and to his seed. He saith not unto his seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say that the testament which was confirmed by God the law, which was made after four hundred and thirty years, doth not disannul to make the promise of no effect. For if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of the promise. Why then was the law? It was set because of transgressions, until the seed should come, to whom he made the promise, being ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now mediator is not of one, but God is one. Was the law then against the promises of God? God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could give life, verily justice should have been by the law. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by the faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. And the Gospel, taking that according to St. Luke, chapter 17. At that time, as Jesus was going to Jerusalem, he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a certain town, there met him ten men that were lepers, who stood afar off, lifted up their voice, saying, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. But when he saw, he said, Go, show yourselves to the priests. And it came to pass, that as they went, they were made clean. One of them, when he saw that he was made clean, went back with a loud voice, glorifying God. And he fell on his face before his feet, giving thanks. And this was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Were not ten made clean? And where are the nine? And there is no one found to return to give glory to God, but this stranger. And he said to him, Arise and go thy way, for thy faith hath made thee whole. Thus far the words of today's Holy Gospel. Father and Father's only ghost of men. <clears throat> we are in an age of the heresy of modernism, which is the grand sewer of all heresies, says St. Pius X, the collection of all errors and all heresies, and this is the age in which we are right now, so it's a very tragic age. And it has many, many sides. But where does modernism come from? comes from Martin Luther, comes from Protestantism, and it has many facets. And one of them comes out in the gospel today, that we have this miracle of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is walking into a certain town, some, just an average town, and he's walking to a certain town, and ten lepers stand afar off, and they forget something, one of the points of the Holy Mass today, which is brought out in the offertory, in thee, O Lord, have I hoped, and I said, Thou art my God, and into thy hands are my times. I have put my times into thy hands. Mea in te tempora mea in manibus tuis. I put my times into thy hands. One thing that we note here in the world today, that one of the, one of the hidden evils of Protestantism, which is very deep in our blood, because Protestantism is entered into the Catholic Church, entered into the Catholic soul, and the Protestant believes that faith alone saves, and that faith is beautiful, and faith is in the clouds, and faith is wonderful, and faith is spiritual, and faith is beautiful, but the world is ugly. And we never want to mix the beautiful with the ugly. And therefore, we see, and we see a priest, he's a man floating in the clouds, he's a spiritual man. Remember many of the, some of my old prisoners telling me, that one of my old prisoners was telling me once upon a time that, when she was nine years old, she saw Sister Mary Battleaxe, whatever her name was. <laughs> Sister Mary Battleaxe actually had a piece of bread in her hand, and she did not know that sisters ate. <laughs> the, the, the sisters, they came in, and they came from heaven, and they, and they didn't eat. They didn't sleep. They were nuns. <laughs> so she was completely shocked when she found out that sisters ate. <laughs> Another one of the seminarians, the two seminarians were sitting at a place eating some ice cream and talking with one of the priests and they were laughing and talking and laughing and talking 
And a man came over and said, I didn't know that priests laughed. Mm. I didn't know that. Mm. And so that, well, now what's interesting about this is somehow because of Protestantism, we believe that the spiritual things are so wonderful and so holy, they belong in heaven. And every now and then we get a little helicopter and we go up to a cloud and we visit heaven. But if you stand on a cloud, you find that you don't stand very long. You'll fall back down to the earth. <laughs> then you go back down to the earth. And on the earth, we have our own rules. That's the real world. And on our earth, we have our own regulations. And we get dirty. It's like you go through life, you get dirty. So every now and then you've got to take a bath. <laughs> And then put on a little deodorant. That's called the good confession. And then you go back out. You get dirty again. Go back. Put on a little deodorant. Take a bath. And that's a nice mass. The good confession. You go out. But if you're in war, you just stay in the battlefield. And this is a lie. God is not in charge in the confessional. He's not in charge at the mass. He rules every atom and molecule from the ends of the universe to the very center of the earth, where is found the real and physical kingdom of hell. He rules there too. As it says in sacred scripture, the breath of the Lord is a torrent of fire. He controls the souls in hell. He controls the souls in heaven. He controls the souls on earth. And he controls every atom and molecule in between. He is not spiritual one of the lies about the Protestant religion and the lies that's entered into our modern world is the lie that God is spiritual and God is holy and God is about spiritual things. And since the priest is a man of God, let him be about the spiritual things, but don't enter my house. Let him be about the spiritual things. Don't enter my business, especially not my money, my pocketbook. Don't enter into my thoughts. Don't enter into my world. You stay in your nice little church, and whenever I need to take a bath, whenever I need to take a shower, whenever I need some deodorant, I'll show up for the spiritual deodorant, and I'll show up for a spiritual bath. And then I'm going to go out in the real world, and I will rule, and I will make my own way. And when do we need Jesus Christ? When do we need God? Well, whenever we're in a fix. What kind of fix? A fix that I can't fix myself. If I can tie my own shoes, I don't need God. If I can walk across the street on my own power, I don't need God. If I've got a good paycheck, I don't need God. But every now and then you lose your job. Every now and then you get a headache. Every now and then you get sick. Every now and then you have a problem, and then you need to turn to God. I haven't heard it for many years, but he's heard it all the time when I got on the plane as a young priest. Father, I hope we don't need your prayers on this flight. Because when do you need prayers from Father? When the plane is crashing. Otherwise, you don't need prayers from Father. But how does that plane fly? God holds every atom and molecule in that plane together. He makes it possible for it to fly. What happens if he forgets about the plane? It disappears, like the famous Malaysia flight a couple years ago that disappeared with some famous people on it. How many rich people that owned a cup that owned that owned uh, three rich businessmen, Chinese businessmen, happened to own the largest steel company in the world, along with a fourth rich man who happened to be a Rothschild. And when one of those men would die, the other would take over the company. And just so happened that four of them were going to get on a plane, but only three of them made the plane. The Rothschild didn't make the plane, and the Malaysia flight miraculously disappeared, and no one ever found it or the three businessmen. But now the Chinese don't own that company anymore. It was just a miracle, miraculous accident. But the fact is that if God forgets about the hairs on our head, they're gone. As it says in Psalm 103, we mention very often, God looks down upon the deer and it runs through the forest. He turns his face away and the deer dies. When do deer die? When do ticks die? When do flies die? When God says, that's enough. <laughs> He's killed more flies than the greatest of fly swatters. <laughs> the fact is that he is the one that determines their life. He is the one that determines their death. And therefore we must understand, God is in me and with, and with me at all times and governs every element of my life. Now what happened? Ten very spiritual lepers who felt their sin. Leprosy is a symbol of sin. 
who felt their filth. Ten lepers were in a certain city, and they saw Jesus Christ coming, and they cried from afar off because they were not worthy to come next to him. They couldn't come next to him because they were lepers. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on us. And then he had mercy on them. And he cured them. And what happened? They didn't need Jesus Christ anymore. And so they went away. And he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. The priest blesses everything. The priest is not there just simply to, to notice that also they're already cured when they go to the priest. They must go to the priest already cured and be blessed. The priest is to bless your car. The priest is to bless your house. The priest is to bless your dogs. The famous call, three in the morning, Father, can you please anoint my dog? <laughs> well, uh, okay, we'll go over and anoint your dog. One time I actually blessed a dog and he had cancer and he was dying. He got better for five days. <laughs> But he got, we get blessed him, and the dog was really sick, and the dog couldn't walk, and we blessed the dog, and then the dog got up, and he was happy for a little bit longer, before he decided to go to doggy heaven. But the fact is, the priest must bless dogs. He must bless the fields. He must bless the, animal, the, the automobiles. He must bless the working places, because God must be in all things. What does the devil do? Divide and conquer. Now, there are many ways to divide. We don't just divide by getting us all try to kill one another. But there's a division that happens in my own life. And that is a division of myself from God in the things of my life. I don't really believe that God is a part of my recreation. I don't really believe he's a part of my food. I don't believe he's a part of everything that I do and all my association with my neighbors, but he's in fact a part of all these things and he must be in the center of all of them. And where does life go wrong? When we forget that, we believe we only need God to forgive sins. We only need God to heal disease. We only need God to give us strength and put us back out so that we can run our own lives. What was the sin of Adam? St. Thomas Aquinas tells us that his particular sin of pride, it was a sin of wanting to rule his own life without God. That's all it was. He wanted to rule his own life without God. He didn't need God. Now we are in an age today where we have forgotten this. We don't just have a spiritual life. There is only life. We don't have the times for God and the times for our other parts of our life, you have your little organizer book, you have time for business, you've got time for recreation, you've got time for yourself. Remember, they always tell you, organizers, make sure you schedule time for yourself. <laughs> schedule time for yourself. Schedule time for your family. Schedule time for work. Schedule time for recreation. Schedule time to remember to send presents to your cousins and especially your customers so that they'll buy more crap from you. And so make sure that you buy, you're going to schedule your times. But what does it say in the offertory today? All my times are in thy hands, O Lord. All my times. All of them. So ten lepers are cured, and ten lepers go show themselves to the priest, and they forget about God. But one gives glory to God. One gives thanks to God. One returns to our Lord Jesus Christ, bows down in adoration at his feet, and gives glory to God and gives thanks. And he is a Samaritan. He is not a Jew. He is not a Catholic. In our age, we will replace the word Jew with Catholic. And what has happened? He is not of the true religion. He comes back and he enters the true religion. What about those that were of the true religion? They forgot about God. And we have a situation now where we very much forget about God in all things. We forget about God in all things. Why do I believe my holy faith? It must be my holy faith. It must be mine. It has to be my whole blood, my whole being. This faith that is given to me by God is true, but this true faith has to be in all of my blood. I must rise and say the morning offering that I offer the day to God. At night, I beg sorrow for my sins and I offer the day again to God. And I go to sleep thinking of God. In Kabilibus Vestris Kombungimini, it says in Psalm 90, in your bedrooms with compunction of heart, consider the things of God. What are the things of God? Everything is a thing of God. He is a God of science. He is the God of history. 
He's a God of math. He is a God of all things. And whoever wants to know math and does not know God, his numbers will go bad. Who wants to know science and does not know God, his science will go bad. Who wants to know history without God, his history will go baloney. Who wants to think without God will go insane. And this is what's happened to our age today. And if we're going to heal the problems of our age today, that God must be brought back to every element of our age. He has to rule our country. He has to rule our Congress. He has to rule all of our laws. He has to rule our, our daily life. He has to rule our dress. He has to rule everything about all that we are. He must rule all of my times. Tempora mea. All my times. Every element of my times are in the hands of God. And we must remember that. You know, the times of the souls in hell are also in God. Every moment for all eternity, the damned shall experience the times of God's wrath. They shall be held in existence by God's power. They shall feel forever his divine justice. They shall not escape God, and they shall be crushed, surrounded by God. On all 360 degrees, crushing them into the center. That's why they cannot move in hell. They will strive to escape his wrath, his justice, his time. But they shall not. Because his time is forever. Oh, we are always in his times. What is it that makes one man different from another? The man that loves God freely gives all of his times to God. The man that does not love him reserves times for himself. I don't have any times for myself. All my times are for God. And all my rest is in God. What is heaven? Heaven is a place of rest. How do we rest? We rest by being in God. And those that are striving to go away from him, they lose all their ability to rest. We see that, for instance, in our age today. People are exhausted always. They must take medication always. They cannot sleep. Why? Because they haven't given their times, all of their times, to God. And the more times we take away from God, the more we escape the source of rest, the more we trace the source of our very existence and all things that hold us together and our purpose, and therefore we are lost. We must have the faith. The true Holy Roman Catholic faith. We have to condemn all the errors and all the heresies. The errors and heresies of Vatican II. And all the errors and heresies of our modern age. But these truths that are in our Lord Jesus Christ, they must enter into my whole being. They must be with me in the morning. They must be with me in the afternoon. They must be with me when I'm sleeping, when I'm working, when I'm playing, when I'm doing nothing. At all times, I must be in God. And then we have peace and then we are ready to combat all of our enemies, and we are not distracted. We are so easily distracted. So ten lepers were cured. Nine forgot. They met Jesus Christ. One of them freely went back to meet him. Did the other nine escape meeting him? Absolutely not. The other nine did meet him. Those nine met him at the judgment. Do you remember me? I am the one that sent you to the priests. I am the one that cured you of your leprosy. I am the one that healed every one of your troubles in life. And you did not return to me to give thanks. You did not spread my holy kingdom. You did not speak of me. You did not give glory to me. You did not do your duty towards me. And now I am asking you, render an account of thy stewardship, for thou canst be steward no longer. And they have no account to render. Therefore... They shall be, hear the words of Christ, depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire. We have to remember, we are now close to the victory of the Blessed Virgin Mary. What must we do? Make sure that we know, love, and serve God daily, and that he be the center of our hearts and thoughts. Because right now we're in a time where the jobs are being lost. The economy is collapsing. The criminals are taking over everything. We're going to have an old gathering next week in Kentucky. So some young people come, 30 or 40 young people will be coming to Kentucky. And uh, they go have, we're thinking of one of the activities. I'm going to talk to the police. One of the activities, we're going to buy some BLM t-shirts. 
And then we're going to go through downtown Louisville and break some windows and smash some doors and burn some buildings down as a little fun activity for the young and old gathering. And then the police can watch us and we'll be okay. One of the activities we might consider doing. Wouldn't consider one of these activities in the past. But now you can have a life. Just get a BLM t-shirt, burn some buildings down, loot and pillage. And if you have any problems, you can borrow a billy bat from the police officer. And then you can attack and maim and kill. What happened to our age? It's very simple. It's an age without God. That's all. It's the most normal thing in the world that we destroy our own cities. It's the most normal thing in the world that we destroy our own families and we destroy everything because God is not the center of our lives. What's well, a possible fun activity for this weekend? What are we going to do? How did all this happen? We have to recognize that God is in charge of the times. He rules all the times. And that this is not for us to determine our own times. He is the ruler of the times. We must follow his law and his rule and his ways. And then there will be peace amongst nations. There, will, there is no other way to get peace amongst nations than that. No other way. And this we cannot forget in our, in our age. In this wicked age in which we live. And remember... Our Lady did say, as things get worse and worse, when they seem the absolute worst, that's when I'm about to have my victory. Our Lord Jesus Christ said, when you see all the bad things happening around you, wars and rumors of wars and strange weather and all kinds of combat and fighting and a great loss of faith, lift up your heads because your redemption is at nigh. And we must lift up our heads now that our redemption is nigh. And let us make sure that we have confidence in God, that he rules all of our times, and that we stand boldly against our enemies in Christ, and not in looking for the foolishness of the answers of the modern world. We're not looking for the false answers, but the true answer of our holy faith, and that we must remember to return and give thanks to God at all times. St. Thomas Aquinas says, The returning of thanks is a perfect, natural consequence and effect of the virtue of humility. Do not give thanks and reject gratitude. It is an effect of the sin of pride. If I come home and see $100,000 on the table, well, I earned it. No gratitude. That's pride. I come home and see $100,000 on the table, and I realize that I'm really poor, and my neighbor put $100,000 on my table, and I didn't deserve it, and I didn't earn it. I'm driven by a spirit to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm driven by a spirit of gratitude. I'm driven also that I must do something good with this money. I better not do something bad with it. This is a natural effect of realizing I'm not worthy of that gift. And we should recognize we are not worthy of our health. We are not worthy of our faith. We are not worthy of our families. We are not worthy of the graces God has given us. Therefore, we should have a perpetual gratitude. He's speaking to an older black gentleman once to come out of the hospital. He said, how are you doing? I'm not proud. I was a very poor man. I have no problem. I got an attitude of gratitude. But the attitude of gratitude is what we are supposed to have, and it is a natural consequence of recognizing we don't deserve what we receive that's good. We deserve all that we receive that's bad, but we don't deserve anything we receive that's good. And when we recognize that, what will happen? We'll start noticing different things. When I am very proud, I notice all the offenses of my pride and live a very miserable life. But if I recognize that everything is a gift of God, I open my eyes and see how many gifts there are. So many wonderful gifts. So many beautiful things God has given to us. And so many wonderful gifts. Joy enters my heart. And I have a spirit of gratitude seeing all the wonderful things that God has given and all the horrible things that he has prevented. And our whole attitude towards life changes because we recognize that we don't deserve whatever we receive. And whatever we do receive is a great gift of God. And let us return thanks to God. And hence that leper came back and he had a happy life. That leopard began a Samaritan, but he ended his life as the friend of God. And he ended his life in the church of God, and he became a saint. And there's a very happy life in between. What about the other nine? They are forgotten. We don't want to be amongst the nine that are forgotten. But let us remember that God is in charge of all the times. And that we are not only to speak to him when we're having a rough time, not only to speak to him when things are going badly and we need help, but speak to him at all times. And thank God for his gifts. Try a new trick one time. The next time you lose your keys and you pray to St. Anthony, 
You pray to St. Anthony, you find your keys, and somebody says, Anthony, I'd have heard of that somewhere. What's an Anthony? Mm. You have no idea what an Anthony is once you've found your keys. Before you find your keys, you've got a great devotion. After you find your keys, you'll forget about Anthony. Try thinking Anthony afterwards. Try speaking to him regularly and thinking every time. You know, thank you, Anthony, for saving these keys 27 times. <laughs> Thank you for all the things you've done for me, Anthony. I'm really grateful, Anthony. I really love you, Anthony. Please help me, Anthony. I love you, Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Try it. Maybe you'll find a few more things. He might even help you keep from losing things that you would otherwise have lost. Don't just ask for what we need, but after we receive what we have needed, let us always have a spirit of gratitude and give thanks to God always. And remember the rule of St. Paul, who said, All things run to good, to those that are of the household of the faith. Remember, all things run to good. The scourges and the stripes that we receive, all the attacks, all the difficulties, everything is unto good. Let all the times, the good ones and the bad ones, and all the times in between, be in the hands of God. God bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.